I really let my emotions bleed when I create videos because I feel like that's how it turns out the most genuine and honest and real. Hello, my loves. Welcome back to the Lavender Lifestyle Podcast. It's Eileen. Today's special guest is someone that you might recognize from YouTube. I know a lot of you probably watch her videos. Her name is Lana Blakely. So Lana Blakely is a Swedish YouTuber creating videos on personal growth and philosophical and social topics. She's also the host of the Lana Blakely Podcast. And here's the cute little bio she gave us. Lana Blakely is a small lady based in Stockholm who likes to openly share her thoughts on the internet. As long as she gets to create, take long walks in nature, eat home cooked meals, and spend time with her dog, she's happy. So, Lana was such a pleasure to have on the podcast. I'm sure you'll enjoy this if you like watching her videos. Like, just to get to know her more, we talk about her creative process, topics that inspire her, like introversion and attachment styles and relationships. And probably my favorite part of our conversation was us talking about misconceptions about the creator or influencer lifestyle and some behind the scenes secrets that people don't know. So, here is Lana Blakely. Hello, Lana. Welcome to the Lavender Lifestyle Podcast. I'm so happy to have you here. I'm happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Yes. So I know a lot of people probably watch your YouTube. I think our audiences overlap a lot. But what I'd like to know is more about your story and your background. Like, Who was Lana Blakely before she was on YouTube? What was I doing? So I was just, I mean, I've always liked the creative stuff. So I bought a camera very early on. I think I was maybe 12 when I got my first camera, but it was definitely just a hobby thing. And uh, then I was working a nine to five, you know, um, and going with that. But then I still felt like I had this I don't know, this urge to create something more. And so I would create like short films and not share them anywhere. I was just doing this for myself. I would create like Mm. horror films and just random things and playing around in Premiere and um, in Stockholm, which is where I'm based. And then I was living in LA for two years. So this was 20, what was it? Six, no, 2016 to 18, I think. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure. What were you doing in LA? So I went there to study. I was studying finance, which is totally unrelated to what I'm doing right now. Yeah. Um, And then I was working as well. But then I think just in LA, a lot of people are in the creative field. And I think I felt inspired. It kind of gave me just courage to try something for myself as well. And so I did. And it's been, I've been doing YouTube now for three years, I think. Yeah, it's been going so well because your videos are so, like they do have like a film kind of feel to them. I don't know how it is, but you give it like a special touch. I'm curious, when you started your channel, did you have like a clear goal or direction? Like, oh, my channel is going to be about this. Not really. I mean, I think like most people, I'm just interested in so many different things. Um, Like I like food, I like animals, I like psychology and philosophy and so many different things. And so I think my first video that I published was a vlog, which is not up anymore. I've removed (laughs) all the old vlogs, um, Mm -hmm. just doing random things like around my home and with friends. And then I kind of felt like it wasn't, I don't know, it wasn't really clicking. And so I just experimented adding music and different editing styles until I found what just felt like most enjoyable. I guess. And it was also working because, you know, as time went by and I was posting things and people found my channel, I I was like, wow, people enjoy this. So (laughs) let's keep going and see where it can take me. And I mean, I'm still not even sure, you know, when people ask, what are your YouTube videos about? I'm like, you know, I don't know. I'm just posting whatever's on my mind. I think, I think in a way I'm just trying to bring up topics that I kind of wish I had known about, whether that is a year ago, a year ago, or when I was a teenager or even, you know, a younger kid. 
So it's kind of for my younger self in a way. That's kind of how I see it. Yeah, because the content you come out with is so relatable. I think that's one of the key things that like engage people. Um, Yeah, if you were to talk about what was the like the moment that things started clicking, like did you notice like, oh, people want to watch more of this? Like what was it for you? Yeah, so I posted a video. This was 2019, I think. Um, It was a video about introversion which, I mean, I did not think anyone would care about introversion. Um, I was just, I had gone through some, something personally and, um, well, okay, let me put it this way, whatever. So I'm introverted. I was kind of dating someone extroverted and that's what kind of inspired the whole video. I've never even shared this online <laughs> um, because it was like two different words kind of coming together. And that was the first time that I really noticed the contrast that can be created. And so I just wanted to, I was writing about it because I journal a lot and I was writing about it and I was like, why don't I make this into a video? Maybe someone is going to relate or whatever. It was more for myself. And so many people related, uh, which was very surprising, but very heartwarming. And so I think that kind of set the tone for where I wanted to take things. Um, yeah, that was like the starting point in a way. Yeah. I'm curious because you talk about such like real and honest topics, do you ever have like fear or feel like, cause it can be scary to talk about these things that yeah. you haven't brought up to the world before. Right. So how, Definitely. do you have that? And how do you get over that? How do you deal with it? I think, you know, I just, I don't know how you're dealing with this, but kind of from the very start, I decided on the things that I did not want to talk about, the things that I wanted to keep out of my videos. So, you know, I don't want to talk about my relationships and not even really my friendships. Like I'll mention things like a friend Mm -hmm. or someone I dated, Mm -hmm. but I'll never go into details about who or even when or anything like that. Um, Or just sensitive topics overall that I know are just, they're so conflicting. Uh, I know it's just going to create such turmoil. So I just try to stay away from those things. And then, you know, I think there's a way to be vulnerable without being too private. And it's not always easy. And I'm sure you can relate to that because you want to be vulnerable. You want to open up your heart and all of that. But you also kind of want to, you don't want to be like a too much of an open book. You still want to keep your your own life to yourself. It's such a boundary that like I've had to struggle over the years because like I want to respect like other people, the the people around me, right? Like they could, they would want to be private. So like there are certain things to talk about, don't want to mention who, don't want to go into details. How much detail do I give? I I actually always think about these things as well. Have you ever experienced in a situation where you're like, you kind of shared something that you wouldn't normally share, but then like the audience received it positively or anything like that where we're like oh that wasn't too bad it was actually yeah I in the beginning like even in my podcast and YouTube videos it was really hard for me to share about like just my childhood like certain parts of my childhood or my family and it was I think it was part of the healing process for me to share and you know whenever I overshare things I just never watch that video (laughs) I just never (laughs) watch Into the pot. I was like, I know I did it, but I'm never gonna yeah, like see it. I can. Really I know it. what happened. <laughs> You're like, yeah. it's out there, but I can't do anything about it now. So yeah, yeah, oh, whatever. I'm not take it back, but I don't want right. like, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And it's it's like a paradox because often the most like vulnerable topics, the ones that really affect us, are the ones that most people really relate to, and the ones that really can affect someone positively. Uh, but sharing that is always like, do, do I want to do that? Is that too much? Or so I think finding a balance is is something you just learn as you as you do this. 
Before we go on, let's take a break to hear about today's sponsor, Bombas. Bombas's mission is simple. Make the most comfortable clothes ever and match every item sold with an equal item donated. So when you buy Bombas, you are also giving to someone in need. They make cozy socks, t-shirts, and underwear with thoughtful design features like invisible seams and soft fabrics. Everything they make is intentional. Their underwear is breathable, their no-show socks are engineered to never fall, and they even work with high quality sweat wicking yarns made to keep you cool when you sweat. And did you know that socks, underwear, and t-shirts are the three most requested clothing items at homeless shelters? That's why Bombas donates one for every item you buy. So far, Bombas customers like you have helped donate over 50 million items of essential clothing. Go to bombas.com slash TLL and get 20% off your first purchase. That's B-O-M-B-A-S dot com slash T-L-L for 20% off. Again, that's B-O-M-B-A-S dot com slash T-L-L. So I want to know about your process in creating content because you do have like such a creative way to go about it. So how do you plan and create your videos? How do I do it? I feel like I've watched so many videos of other YouTubers being like, this is my routine. And it's all super sophisticated. They have this, you know, schedule and everything is super planned out and they have a whole team, uh, which looks like a dream to me. But to be honest, I'm kind of, I mean, I do plan, but I'm also a bit spontaneous because a lot of what I talk about is current in my life. Like maybe let's say something happens to me this week. Like I already start writing about it for a video in a month. So it's Mm -hmm. all very current, not all, but a lot of it is current. Um, So I just, I kind of check in with myself to see where I'm at, what's interesting to me right now. Like, is it relationships? Is it purpose? Am I feeling lost? Am I feeling happy? Like, where am I at? And then I go from there. I write down everything that I want to say, um, film that, and then the whole filming B-roll process and seeing just just the mood that I want the video to be, if I want it to be a bit more joyful or a bit more um, laid back. And I really go, like, I really let my kind of emotions bleed when I create videos Um, because I feel like that's how it turns out the most genuine and honest, um, and real. What's your process like? I'm so curious. Well, before I answer that, so when you have like a talking video, how much do you plan out? Like, um, do you just have outlines of what you're going to talk about? Or do you have like an idea of a script already? Yeah, I do. I mean, I have, I write down pretty much an entire script beforehand. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, oh, you don't do that? No, for when I'm sitting there and talking, I don't yeah. like writing a script. Only if it's right. a voiceover, I'll write a script. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, totally. Because, yeah. um, I mean, I've tried both methods, just being like, this is a topic. These are the talking points. Let's sit yeah. down and talk. But I'm already kind of a slow talker. like, mm. And a lot of people have complained about that. They're like, can you speed it up? <laughs> so when I sit down and it's not speed enough, yeah. I mean, they're like, oh. come on, I'm listening on like two times speed and it's still not <laughs> fast enough. I'm like, wow. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> so when I used to sit down and just try to talk based on like a few points, it just slows me down that much more because then I sit there and I'm thinking and I'm like, hmm, this is interesting. And then I get off track and I want to include a bunch of other things. And it just... Like, it's fine for a conversation like this, but I mean, people's attention span is just not long enough for me to sit there and, you know, think in real time. So I write everything down, but then when I'm recording, I kind of know what I've written, pretty much all of it, but then I just talk to the camera and have some notes um, on the side. Yeah. Very interesting. Yeah. Maybe that's why your videos are more like punchy. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, oh, she doesn't ramble. She just goes like, you know, the point. Uh, that's the secret. Yeah. It's just writing everything down. And obviously yeah. I'm editing because there's still Definitely. pauses. And um, sometimes maybe this happens to you as well. Like while you're recording, you start thinking about something else as well. And you're like, this is interesting. Maybe I should include that as well. Um, so that definitely happens where you kind of go off script. 
Yeah. Yeah. Love it. Um, yeah, my process, I, I don't like to write out a script for sitting talking videos because I don't like reading off a script and I don't think I can remember everything that I wrote <laughs> word right. for word. Um, I'll remember like the general thoughts, but usually when I write it, I just end up writing more and more ideas and I'm like, this oh, is yeah. too much. <laughs> I'm not going to be able to, to do this. So anything sitting down talking, I'm just, I, I just have an outline and then I just go one by one. Um, voiceovers, I always procrastinate on because the writing, the script part is just, I always have resistance around that. Um, but I mean... Every video, like there's different types of videos where I have different flows, right? Like sometimes I just film my day and then I just use that as B-roll right, <laughs> on top yeah. of whatever topic I want to talk about. Um, yeah, there, it's, I, I feel like you, you'll you understand the different types of. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it it does differ. Um, yeah. That's why, because I was, I mean, I have a podcast. We're on summer break now, but that was such an enjoyable kind of, Cause it's not scripted at all. It's, I mean, I, it's not as sophisticated as your podcast. I just sit down and I'm like, what do I want to talk about today? And that's kind of my, the outcome that I have, um, where it's, I can just speak freely and not think about what to say or having a script or anything like that. So it's a nice, it's a nice contrast, I think. Yeah, definitely. You talk about so many different concepts or philosophies, um, both on YouTube and podcast. I want to get into what has been your favorite, like something that you've talked about that you're like, everyone should know this, or or you're maybe you're like the most passionate about speaking about it. I think definitely relationships and dating. Uh, like I'm a sucker for everything dating, even like TV shows and documentaries and studies and anything that has to do with just human interaction and relationships and attraction and anything of that sort. I don't know what it is. It really pulls me in. So I think anytime I decide to do a video on that, I'm always more excited than okay. I think than any other video. And also because I think it's so interesting and I'm sure you can relate. One of the best parts of creating videos is the reactions and the conversations that go on in like the comment section and people sharing their own thoughts and stories and people in the comments chatting with each other. And I think when you talk about relationship, it kind of creates a lot of conversation. And I love reading that. Um, <laughs> I will sit there for hours and, and scroll through the comments. And, yeah. yeah, I love it. It's so interesting. I see. Um, okay. And I mean, I want to go, what about relationships? Like, have you had like a light bulb moment or some, I don't know, something that you'd like to share here? <laughs> Let's go deeper. I'm like so many things. So what do I even pick? Whatever. So right first. now, right now I'm very into attachment theory. I don't know if you're, I've heard if of you're it. running it. Yeah. I think I was aware of it. I saw it somewhere. Have you made a video about attachment theory? I haven't because it's one of okay. those topics I've been aware of, but I haven't gone deep into. So why don't right. you explain <laughs> your perspective? Yeah. yeah, it's so interesting. So um, I was also aware of it, never really looked into it. I don't know how I, I think I was just searching for like relationship books or something like that. And then I came across this book called Attached. I don't remember the author, uh, which is bad of me, but it's named Attached. And it's basically about how he presents different attachment styles that people have. So you can be secure, you can be anxious, or you can be avoidant. And then there are some other categories as well, but these are like the main ones that he presents. And basically these attachment styles kind of explain why we behave the way we do in relationships and kind of why other people behave the way they do in relationships. And it's everything from how you can best solve conflict if you are of different attachment styles or who is better suitable with someone else and who should not be dating. And there are so many examples of different, like real life examples of people who are different or have different attachment styles. And you can just really relate to a lot of what's being said. You know, I've definitely looked back on my relationships reading this being like, 
oh, that explains a lot of why I was like that or why this person was behaving in that way. And I, I don't know. It's like I had this moment of epiphany, just realizing a lot of things. And I know it's very cliche being like, this book changed my life. But I mean, this book changed my life. I like I should have read it earlier. I really recommend it. And just not the book, just getting, um, learning more about attachment theory. I think it's it's very valuable for for anyone who is interested in having any kind of relationship, whether that is romantic or just platonic or even your work and family relationships. It really, mm. it explains a lot. A lot of things so you may not want to hear. It applies to all relationships, not just romantic ones. Yeah, exactly. So when this yeah. book gets focused on romantic ones, but I mean, you can definitely, once you read it, you're going to, you're going to start seeing how people around you are like, you're going to start categorizing people being like, Oh, my mom is that way. And my sister is that way. And it's, yeah, it's, it's such a joy. And, but uh, yeah, it's a bit uncomfortable too. Cause when you read it, like I said, you kind of realize how you have been behaving in certain situations and it's always a bit scary feeling exposed like that, but I think it's also valuable. So yeah. Cause then you start to accept like, oh, okay, I, I understand I am this way and like you can work around it, right? Is attachment style something that you're supposed to, like you're supposed to try to move to like the secure attachment or is it just something that you, you're going to be forever? So accept? the good news is that, no, you're not going to be that way forever. Probably, I mean, you could, but there is a way. So the secure attachment style is basically like the ideal style, but he doesn't frame it that way because the point is not to make you feel like there is something wrong with you for not being that way. You know, a lot of it, a lot of the way that we are stem from childhood and that is not something that we control. And, but it's also other factors like the relationships that we've had when we've been older and our dating experience and whatnot. So what's really interesting is that you can actually move away from your attachment style and become more secure. And also different people kind of trigger you differently. So if you are anxious and you're dating someone who is avoidant, you're going to be a lot more anxious than if you're mm -hmm. dating someone who is secure, who's actually going mm -hmm. to make you more secure. Yeah. Um, so yeah. Yeah. yeah look that makes look for that. <laughs> Okay. Um, I also want to talk to you about introversion since that is a pretty big topic that you talk about. Um, how have you learned to enjoy being an introvert and embrace this lifestyle? I'm an introvert too. Like I'm always yeah. alone. <laughs> High five. Yeah. Um, um, when I was younger, like a lot of introverts, they, I thought something was wrong with me or whatever. Um, and then when I started learning about introversion instead of fighting my nature I just started accepting it and enjoying it because once you hear from someone or from somewhere that the way that you are is actually normal you're fine I think that is a time when you can start to just tap into yourself and enjoy yourself the way that you are instead of resisting it and trying to change and trying to become something else. So really just learning about it and definitely with age comes, you know, becoming more comfortable in your own skin. Like I think even if I was 14 learning everything about introversion, I would have probably still not been as comfortable in that as I am right now. Cause there's a lot of pressure and, um, you know, you want to hang out with the cool kids and you want to be out there and you want to fit in and, you know, fitting in, um, it's something we always want to do, but especially when we're in our teen years, that's when it's crucial. Um, so I think just with age and then learning about it and just making sure that the, the decisions that I make are for myself. Now that doesn't mean that you should, or that I, you know, because I think it's easy being like, oh, well, I'm an introvert. So therefore I don't need to reach out to my friends. I don't ever have to see them. I can just say no to everything. So it's easy to kind of become to like, you kind of start using it as an excuse. I mean, I've been there. Mm -hmm. So I'm mm -hmm. just speaking from my own experience and you can get kind of deep into that. And then you realize, oh, I'm actually not being a great friend right now. And so I think 
with any label you put on yourself, just being a little careful so that you don't take it to an extent where right. you just kind of lose yourself and you become some this. people can like very identify with introversion and then that becomes who they are and then right. they, they live life only according to that like definition and exactly the truth is we're all on the spectrum between introversion yeah. and extroversion and Definitely. what the pandemic has taught me is I, even though I'm an introvert I do value human connection and I do need to see my friends and and speak to other people once in a while maybe just less than extroverts do but you know, it's still in everyone. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. totally. I, I definitely agree, you know, and I think when I was very deep into introversion, like reading about it a lot, a lot, I kind of became that person who was like, oh, now I kind of feel like meeting up with my friends. But then I was like, wait, am I an introvert if I want to meet up with all my friends four times this week? And it's like, that's not what it's about. So I think it's easy getting too um, attached to this definition or meaning of something and kind of forgetting that like you said it's a spectrum nothing is black and white we're all we're all different based on how we're feeling and who we're hanging out with and what we're going through and it's not like a, you're either that or you're that so right yeah just don't get attached to any any label or like concrete definition of something because we're all like fluid and we're all ever changing right exactly yeah, so I'm just trying to avoid that overall because I think, you know, I used to be like, I'm an introvert, I am a vegan, I am this, I am that. And that's fine. You know, some people enjoy feeling that kind of belonging and identifying with the group. And sometimes it can be helpful. But for me personally, I found that it's it's not very helpful. It actually makes me kind of feel boxed in and restricted. And I just don't want to feel that way. Yeah, I completely agree with you. It's more and more it's about like, like, cause I used to love doing personality tests. I still am very yeah. into all those things like astrology <laughs> and this and that. Too. And the more you learn about it, the more you like add a new label on, yeah. right? Oh, in numerology, I'm life path five and in <laughs> astrology, exactly. I have this, this, this. And then you start to like identify with all these labels. And then you start like, it's, I think that the balance of life is like being aware of these things, but not like attaching yourself to them and being like, okay, like, does this resonate with me? Because it doesn't have to. Like, I can be anything else if I choose to, right? Like, yeah, don't, don't let these, like, external things define you. Right. Let's take a break for today's sponsor of the podcast, Ephemeris. You all know how much I love astrology. It's a powerful tool to guide your self-discovery, and there's so much you can learn from just your birth chart. For example, I have three planets in Libra in my fifth house, so I know that creativity and balance is really important for my soul. Ephemeris is creating astrological talismans, basically a highly customizable piece of jewelry based on your birth chart. To create your own, you'll need your date, time, and location of birth. It's okay if you don't know your birth time, you can still create a version of your chart. As you enter your info, the birth chart will update so you'll be able to see how your talisman will actually look. You can choose from silver, gold, or rose gold, and each unique piece is handmade in the US. And it also comes with three in-depth reports on your birth chart. My report was 82 pages long, so there's definitely a lot of good info to explore about yourself. Right now, Ephemeris is offering 15% off for our listeners with offer code TLL at checkout. That's E-P-H-E-M-E-R-I-S dot C-O and offer code TLL at checkout to unlock 15% off your talisman today. How did you get into astrology? Because I've been, I mean, I've taken some tests and I've looked oh, up. Yeah. I know nothing about it. I know like my moon, my sun. What's the third one? Rising. My the rising, rising sign. Mm -hmm. right? I remember looking them up and getting into it just a little bit. Yeah, but there was so much information everywhere it's that I was so, like, I don't even know where to look. It's it's very. It, it can go so deep, right? right. Um, I was always into like horoscopes for fun and just in college, you know, just knowing your friend's sun signs. And I think it was in 2018 that I decided to dive deeper. Um, I read an astrology book called The Inner Sky, which teaches you what every planet means and how to read a birth chart. And then that's how I became interested because I was like, wow, this is so detailed. And I read like a couple books after that. Yeah, the Inner Sky by Stephen 
Forest, I believe. There are a couple of books I can recommend you. Yeah, I um, love that. For starters, uh, what I love about astrology is it's like a new language. I love right. learning languages. So it's like learning to read symbols, right? Mm. If the sun represents your ego or your, the, you know, there's a lot of like it's it's playing with symbols and meaning and it's not concrete it's not black and white and it's to me it's fun because there is a lot of like truth that can be gained from it like from learning your friends and you know what's on their chart so it's just been fun <laughs> well have you found that it's had like that you've like what is the what are the positives of learning about it do you feel like it's impacted your life or your relationships or oh, yeah. Definitely really? so mm-hmm. much because you basically there, there's like, I, I guess there's like a little truth to be found in so many different parts of astrology. Like if you want to l- know more about your purpose and why you're here, like astrology can give you clues. If you want to know about your relationships or your career or just every aspect of life, astrology can give you a clue. It's not going to give you the answer. Obviously it's not going to tell you like what decision to make in life, but it gives you like a clue. Like this is the challenge you have to go through in your relationships in this lifetime. This is the theme of your home life. This is the theme of your creativity. And so I've learned so much about myself and the people around me through astrology, but it's, I'm still a beginner. <laughs> like yeah. it's, it's, it's such a complex thing. And another part of astrology is not just about your personality, but it's about like what the world is going through at the moment. Cause, cause collectively we go through different like themes and we learn different lessons and like there are cycles, right. Where like maybe, mm. maybe you have to learn this lesson every 250 years. Cause this planet takes 250 years to move around the, I don't know, the chart. And so it's fun for me to see like macro things on the macro level, as well as like in your own personal life. Wow. Like (laughs) I didn't even realize that it was that. Yeah. Like for example, like things like the pandemic or world wars, those are like, you can kind of infer these things through what's happening in the collective astrology. Wow. Yeah. I mean, it's- I need to read more about it. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. You can learn more about it. I know a lot of people are skeptical, but like I said, astrology doesn't tell you what's going to happen, but it tells you like the theme or maybe what challenges or lessons are to be learned. Yeah. You know, cause I always see people being like, um, let me think of an example. Like, oh, the, the reason I'm feeling this way is because my moon is in, mm. I don't know the terms, like yeah, in Saturn yeah. or something like that. Yeah. And I'm like, what is that? You know, I want to be able to yeah, I think relate you would, these things. If if you enjoy learning, like I think you, once you get like a basic understanding of these things, it, it can be really fun because you start to understand. It's like I said, it's like a new language. <laughs> right. Wow. Um, okay. Well, yeah. I'm going to start reading at least the book that you, that yeah. I wrote down. I'll introduce, I'll, I'll like send you the, the names of everything. Yeah, for sure. Okay. Um, going back to what you've talked about on your channel I, I know we talked about how like sometimes it's difficult to share certain things. I'm curious, like what's been the concept that you were afraid to share or talk about things that you had like a really, like you almost didn't post it, but you did. Ooh. Um, I think many things, I think in the beginning I was definitely a lot more reserved because I was kind of testing the water and seeing how people react and is anyone going to be mean about this or how is it going to go? And then once I started being more and more open and seeing people's reactions and also just how good it felt to, you know, open up your heart and put it out there, it just became easier doing that again and again and again. So, I mean, in the beginning, I think everything was difficult, even being like, yeah, so I was not very confident. That was scary. Even just mentioning that to the internet, because it's like, okay, now everyone is going to know that I was an insecure kid or I was struggling with body image. Okay, now everyone is going to know that I've been struggling with body image. So I think really every topic, more or less, um, there is always a bit of resistance and a bit of, is this too much? Am I oversharing? Should I keep this to myself? Uh, but I think what's really, you know, soothing that feeling is always afterwards when someone is like, I can relate, this helped me as well. And I was also feeling this way and thank you for sharing that. And I'm going to share this with my friend who was going through something similar. And that's kind of like the, um, the thing that kind of brings me calm. 
after I'm kind of nervous because to this day, and I don't know if you're like this too, but I feel nervous posting. Like anytime <laughs> I publish, I'm like, okay, yeah, it's out there. Like it's too but late. That's a good sign because it means for each video, you're pushing yourself a little, you're challenging yourself. And it, it, I think it, it, it's, it's good to be vulnerable online because people will relate to it, but, but that's the scary part. <laughs> the scary part is just putting yourself out there. Definitely. Do you still get nervous when you post something? I only for certain videos. Yeah. You know, I just saying, I was looking at your channel and the first video that is up is from eight years ago. So do you still get nervous when you're posting? Oh, you mean like the first video I ever posted? <laughs> yeah, it was eight years yeah, ago. Yeah, yeah it right? was. I know. Yes, I've had my channel for eight years now, which is a long time now. Um, yes, in the beginning, it w- I was more nervous posting. And I think over time, you get a little bit more confident. Yeah. And now I don't get nervous for every video, but only if it's a video where it was like a little harder to make or where I talk about something more like sensitive and vulnerable. Um, I feel like I'm at a place now where I'm pretty open. Like I can cry on camera. I like, I'm yeah. like, I, well, there I haven't are done certain that yet. things. Oh, really? <laughs> I, yeah. I think you just get, you get better practice with being vulnerable right. and I'll, I'll share something. I'm like, like I share like a, basically my recent video, I talked about healing from the fears I have in relationships because of like the way I saw my parents growing up. And I was like, I realized after like I finished the video, I was like, okay, that was a little sensitive. And now people are going to know that I have these, like, I don't know. Um, So I, the fear is small. I still have Mm -hmm. it, but it's definitely not like when I started. No. Oh yeah. Yeah. No, definitely. Yeah. I think that's another thing about, yeah. Sorry. Sorry, Another thing that I have always felt was it's easier for me to like be vulnerable online to anonymous people than it is to like people in my own life. Do you agree with that? Or how do you I mean, I'm pretty vulnerable in real life as well. Like I love just, like I will call my sister and she won't even be listening. I'll just be going on and on and on about like <laughs> what I'm going through and what I'm feeling. And oh, she'll just be I like, see. uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah. And then he said this. And then we went there and we did that. And I was feeling this way. And she's like, right. Yeah. Okay. So you're more of an open book with like <laughs> yeah, people close to you totally. in your life. And sometimes I just want to vent. Like, I don't even care if she's getting back yeah. to me. Like half an hour will go by and I'm like, okay, I feel better now. Bye. That's so funny. Like, Bye. So <laughs> as your free therapist. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I appreciate that. Although yeah. I wouldn't pay for that because she's not giving me anything back sometimes, but, <laughs> but it's fine. I appreciate it still. Um, yeah. So no, I, f- I feel I'm pretty vulnerable in person. Okay. As well. But do you feel like being vulnerable online has made you more vulnerable in person yes. or in real life as well? Like something about what, like how YouTube was in my life was YouTube gave me confidence to be more of myself because when I was younger, I just, I don't know. I, I kind of like had a wall up with my friends. I wouldn't share everything. I would be, I wouldn't know how to get vulnerable. And then it's through YouTube, through like me sharing myself online with others that I started to get more confident because I'm like, oh, if I share this, like people resonate with it. So maybe I should try doing this with my friends in real life. Like I I just always had that difficulty. And before Lavender, I had like a music channel. So I actually started with music. Like I was scared to tell people I like to sing or scared to perform. And then I would do it on YouTube and then my friends found out, they're like, oh my God, I didn't know you sing. (laughs) And then, so obviously I had to start becoming more confident about that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a beautiful thing. There are so many, I mean, YouTube has given me so much, I think for me as well, just being more open about things and with my confidence and just like believing in yourself as well. Cause there's a lot of fear when you put yourself out there. And then when things like, it's like, what's the worst that's going to happen? And then the worst isn't that bad. And so mm-hmm. you just get more comfortable and confident, yeah. I think. Yeah. It's, I think it's really good for build, like getting over those fears, building your confidence. Definitely. Yeah. Um, so since, I mean, we're both YouTubers and, and people listening might not be. So I want, I'd like you to share some of like maybe misconceptions or maybe things that people don't know about your life that they would be surprised to hear? Right. Ooh, uh, that's a good question. I think, you know, when you watch someone online, it's so, 
I mean, obviously you're going to get like a, an idea of who they are and maybe even more of an idea. You're going to be like, I know this person, they're this and that and this and that, but obviously there is more to you and to me and to everyone. Cause we're just sharing such a tiny bit. So I think on my like Instagram stories, for example, I'm a bit more like, I'll share more of my life. And sometimes people will be surprised that I'm like out doing stuff for like, I have friends and I like hanging out. I like going to the restaurants and whatnot. So that's something that if you're only watching me on YouTube, I may come across as just, I mean, I love being at home. I'm at home at like 75% of the time. Uh, but maybe they don't know that I actually love hanging out with people that I care about and socializing when I'm comfortable with those people. That's like the best thing. Well, second, the best thing, cause being alone is I think the best thing, <laughs> but second, the best thing that I know. Uh, so maybe that I'm more open and more goofy. Cause I know that my videos are very, like they're very produced, they're edited and, you know, I have the script and everything. So it can come off as kind of stiff. Whereas in real life, I'm kind of disorganized. I'm very clumsy. <laughs> um, and I just don't think people would assume that based on yeah. like watching what I'm doing. Yeah, based on your videos, you look so polished and I know. you're always at home. <laughs> <laughs> right. exactly. no, I understand that because you can only share so much online. Like people are not watching you 24 seven. And also what you share is what you choose to share. So exactly. it's a reminder exactly. that it's not all of you. It's just one slice of you. Yeah, I think that's com like complex. Yeah, for sure. I think that's so important for people to kind of remind themselves of being like, oh, this is 10 minutes of a edited, yeah. you know, produced. Very scripted and planned. Scripted piece of plan. content. Exactly. A uh, piece of content. Yeah. Um, and it does not fully reflect this person's life or personality or who they are. I mean, it's a, it's a portion of it, obviously, but it's, there's so much more to, to everything that you mm -hmm. see online. And I think Definitely. when you, what's kind of scary is when you start like getting into this world of social media, you realize how easy it is to kind of portray yourself any way that you want. Um, so I remember, I mean, there have been times when like one time I was filming a bunch of B-roll and I was crying in between the B-rolls because I was having mm. an awful day. But when you see the B-roll online, I wasn't showing my face because I was just like very sad. It's just like me walking around casually, but I had to get the B-roll that day because I was on a deadline. Yeah. But it's like, you don't, you don't know that. You don't know that I'm feeling like shit. Can I say yeah. that? Yeah, um, you can say that. <laughs> <laughs> you don't know that I'm feeling like shit that day or, you know, whatever. It's so easy to portray yourself just in any way you want. And that's kind of scary when you think about it. Yeah. Um, it's not the truth, but it's what, like, you, basically you get to shape your identity or what you share online. And there's, there could be a whole different story behind the scenes. For sure. Yeah. And I think it's good for people to be aware of that and also uh, be aware of the fact that, you know, we all have our own style of video and aesthetic, if you will. So, you know, generally speaking, I like the more moody kind of slow down uh, music choices and color grading and all of that. And it's kind of like a movie where if you see that, you're going to assume that this is something mm -hmm. that's going to be a bit sad or whatever, unhappy or depressed or anything like that. So, you know, pay or be aware that like as a viewer, that it's a lot of it comes down to just the aesthetic. Like I could be saying the exact same thing, but changing the color grading, changing the music. And all of a sudden it's like, oh, this is like a very happy, you know, upbeat kind of video. And then you change the music and some of the shots and the colors. And all of a sudden you're like, Ooh, this is deep. So, <laughs> you know, I mean, <laughs> film is an art. I and that's so true. Have yeah. you thought about that? How Yes. Like these tweaks can definitely change how it's being perceived. I, I think I don't, tr oh yes. Well, it's funny because for my videos, I purposely don't choose like moody, slow music because sometimes when I put it on, I'm like, this sounds too serious. This is so <laughs> dramatic. I, I don't want this story to sound like it's so, you know, so I, I try yeah. to keep my videos more light and I, I have a specific type of like tempo or music that I choose, but it, it's true. Like just changing the music and the coloring changes the whole mood and people don't realize that it's, it's part of the art. Like people think yeah. that's the true you. 
exactly like, always so deep and she's always so exactly right? exactly and I'm, I'm like maybe part of it but it's also an aesthetic I'm just I think I'm just naturally also drawn to things that are a bit more nostalgic and moody and I don't want to say dark but you know to that way so I'm like making an effort sometimes to choose like music that is a bit more happy and whatever just to kind of Cause it's not sad. Like what I'm talking about isn't sad, but I don't know. I'm just like drawn to that kind of. But, but with your mood. like calm talking style with that music, it, it does fit. Like right. it is a mood. I hope so. Yeah, yeah, it is a mood. I love that you brought that up because so many people compare themselves to what they see on social media. I'm sure you yeah. know on Instagram, on YouTube, they think that these influencers live like a perfect lifestyle, which I, I mean, I'm sure now people know everyone's human, right? But it's also like recognize what you see is just a sliver of them. It's not what's real. It's not what's true. It could be, it, it's, you know, they put so many layers on top of it. Definitely. I mean, I, I saw a video on, um, I think it was TikTok. This was a while ago of a girl. Um, I think she was, she was just standing in like her backyard no, I think she was sitting and she was drink she was sitting on the grass and she was like drinking water from a bottle or something. But there was like a motivational text about, you know, living your dream and whatnot. And the music was very, you know, the kind of music that gives you goosebumps, right? Mm -hmm. And this video got so many likes and people were like, wow, goals and whatnot. And then someone was commenting saying, she's literally just sitting in the grass drinking water. But it's, it's all this aesthetic. like surrounding yeah. stuff that's making yeah. it seem like this super motivational, exactly. inspirational thing. So I think just being aware of that kind of makes you realize that you can kind of also create that, even like in your yeah. own home. Yeah. Um, <laughs> like try it as an experiment to anyone listening. Try to create like the most inspirational, upbeat video that you can make in your own home. Like choose the music and the angles and whatever. And you're going to realize that you can kind of twist things yeah. scarily enough, however you want, more or less. <laughs> yeah. This reminded me where there was a trend where, and it still might be a trend of like peaceful daily vlogs. Have you seen those? They're like yeah. cinematic and they play this really <laughs> peaceful music and it's like right. just doing their daily life, but it looks so beautiful. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'll, I'll do that too. Like, cause when that was a trend, I was like, Ooh, let me make a peaceful day in my life. And I'm literally doing the same thing, but I changed the music and maybe yeah. even did like zoom close-up shots or right. slow motion <laughs> right for sure yeah. and it's, it's actually it's very fascinating how these things change so much even if I'm posting like a video of um I don't know like my dog doing something and I'll put like a cute song over it when in real life he was being annoying he was barking <laughs> whatever but then you like with the song you're like oh it's so cute and sure it's cute I mean all dogs are cute so it is but also if I were to just have the original audio it would have been a bit different. Like it would have been perceived not as cute, but just like as yeah. another story or whatever. So <laughs> yeah, it's very interesting. It's so funny. <laughs> okay, let's move on. I'm curious, do you have a sort of like daily or weekly routine? Any kind of like non-negotiable habits and things like that? So always keep a physical, actually, wait, let me, I keep a physical calendar. Mm -hmm. it's this Snack. one. Oh, yay it's from lavender <laughs> the weekly reset planner oh thank you <laughs> i use that every day um oh my gosh. Uh, just as a calendar and the most important tasks and whatever um so that is a must have i cannot like if i don't have the calendar and it's always open on my desk yeah. i'm like what am i doing today um so that is a must um i spend a lot of time with my dog I always have to get like the morning cuddles. You have a dog too, right? Yes. <laughs> yeah. So morning cuddles, breakfast, going on a long morning walk, hopefully, or preferably going pretty early because I live in the city and it's just super crowded around like eight and seven. So I try to go as early as possible where it's a bit more calm and um, I cook a lot. If I eat out too much, I really don't feel good. So I always make sure I'm putting enough time aside to make myself, you know, a decent breakfast, lunch, dinner, just to feel like I'm functioning properly. Um, I'm like, what are some other things that aren't super cliche that I do? It's okay. We want to, I'm sure people just want to know more about what your daily life looks like. Yeah, I think it's just, I mean, I live a very 
I'm like, I live a very simple life. Um, but I wake up, <laughs> I spend the first hour taking care of my dog and spending time with him. Coffee, I got an espresso machine like two months ago. It's changed nice. my life. <laughs> it's one of the best investments I've ever made for myself. Definitely. Just like drinking a foamy espresso or latte in the morning just sets the tone for the rest of the day. And it's a game changer. Um, and then I spend a lot of time just writing and creating videos and writing out ideas and journaling. And so I'm, I'm very much in my own little world for, you know, a large portion of the day, but I always make sure I get like a long walk in always every day, regardless of weather, maybe not midwinter in Sweden. Cause it gets pretty snowy and cold. Um, but yeah, definitely a big fan of long walks. Um, just being out as much as possible when I'm not working or mm -hmm. being in my little nook. Do you have kind of like a time where you're like, okay, I'm done with work. Let me relax. Or is that kind of fluid? No. <laughs> <laughs> How so? I'm like, that's the dream. Uh -huh. um, mostly because I think my inspiration is just, I can't control it. You know, sometimes I'll wake up in the morning and feel super motivated to write or film or edit something. And then sometimes I don't feel that way until like 9 p.m. And I'm like, wow, now I need to sit down and do this thing. And then I look at the time and it's like 2 a.m. And I'm like, oop, time to go to bed. <laughs> so I've tried having more of like a schedule for when I'm doing things And I've gotten better at it. I've gotten better at actually deciding, okay, enough is enough. Let's shut everything down and go have dinner or whatever. Um, but I definitely still have those days where it's just very hard, you know, controlling the, the motivation or the inspiration. Because sometimes I'll get an idea midday or at night before bed. And I can't really wait with that idea. I have to kind of mm -hmm. sit down right away and start writing. Wow. Even before uh, bed. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Even before, I, I feel you like before bed. You, uh -huh. Yeah. And I feel like before bed is when I'm kind of, unfortunately, mostly like likely to come up with something. So at yeah. the very least, the I'll way, bring actually, up, I get the are? most ideas as I'm like uh, in bed about to fall asleep yes. and then I have to write it in my phone. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah. That's what I was going to say. So sometimes like I won't get up and write down a full script. I'll just pick up my phone, go into like the notes app um, and just write as much as I can think of in that very moment and then go to bed and then work on it later. Yeah. If it still if it still sounds like a good idea, like sometimes I'll right. wake up Does and be like, mm, not sound the same great. sometimes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like like I that always happens. feel yes, it, that same exact thing happens to me where like I'm like, oh, this idea is so great and I'm so inspired, and I write all these notes and then I come back to it. I'm like, okay, it's kind of whatever. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it wasn't that great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It happens I, to me too. I find that it's hard too to like because when you have that inspiration, it's easy to like create when you're in that mood, but it's hard sometimes to like pick up where you left off. Like you might not feel inspired when you look at this idea again. So what do you do? Like, do you, like, how do you, do you try to work on videos that you're, you don't feel inspired with or like, what's your, I guess, how do you do this? So like anytime I start working on a video, I always want to make that video. I start off very fueled and excited. And sometimes that fuel lasts throughout the video until it's done. And sometimes it doesn't, like I'll work on a video for so many hours and then I'll be like, this is not very interesting. <laughs> um, and then I'll either try to find other sources of inspiration to kind of get back into that mode. And sometimes it works, but if it goes, like if there's too much time passing and I'm still like, this isn't great, this doesn't feel right to me, um, then I'll sadly have to stop working on the video because... Like it's very hard getting to the finish line um, and doing it well when you just aren't feeling it anymore. Yeah. How do you deal with that? Yeah, it's I, I need to feel motivated and inspired to create. And and I notice that if I leave an idea that I've worked on, maybe I'll work on half an idea. And if I leave it not untouched for too long and I come back to yeah. it, it's I, I can't pick it back up. Yeah, <laughs> like it's, it's not hard. 
It is hard. Um, I mean, sometimes I try to like push through it. I'm like, I knew this was a good idea. Let me try to do it. Um, but, but yeah, I definitely, I prefer when like, that's why I just try, if I have an idea, I'll just try to finish it yeah. <laughs> as soon as, as possible. Soon as possible. Right. If I have the inspiration, I'm like, I have to use this now or else it's not going to be there if I wait yeah. too long. I'm the same way. And I think part of it is because like I said, a lot of what I talk about is so current. So like if I write down an idea and then I try to pick it back up in like a month, I may not be in the same headspace as I was a month ago. You know, it's not very interesting to me anymore because I've kind of moved past it or whatever. And I'm in a new kind of space um, and have other ideas and things that I want to talk about and share. And so I definitely get what you're saying where you kind of want to start working on it ASAP and finish it as soon as possible to maintain that, like that is interesting to you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So I want to know your thoughts on the future of content, right? That's always like a topic <laughs> to, uh, around influencers is what do you feel about like the way platforms are changing and people's shortening attention spans? <laughs> well, it's, it hasn't been great for me because like looking back on my videos, they're very slow and there are very few cuts. Um, and then because I think my attention span is also shortened. I have started talking faster and doing more cuts and trying to kind of just make it a bit more, not as slow because I lose interest and mm -hmm. I think other people lose interest as well. So I've definitely started changing up the pace of my videos. And I know people have noticed, some people have mentioned it. Um, not everyone likes it. Some people kind of want the slower format, but it's a combination of what I think people want and also what I, for myself, where I'm at. Um, but I've had a bit of a hard time. I know you've been doing a lot of shorts and, uh, right. It's a struggle though. I'm tr I was trying for a while. I just didn't do it, but now I'm at least what I'm doing is I'm just like re-editing my YouTube videos. For, yeah. Like, that, that's great. Yeah, instead of, of creating original ones. Cause before right. I had that pressure on myself to like be on every platform, but it's right. too much. I know it is. Mm -hmm. And you don't want to lose the spark. And I think if you, if you spread yourself too thin, you're eventually gonna, I like, I think it's hard being very good at too many things. Um, and even if you are successful being very good at so many things, I think it's hard being very passionate and interested in too many things. So you kind of had to pick and choose, but I think like you said, just taking it's and bits from videos and making them into TikToks and reels. I mean, that works. That's a very good idea. I'm not great at it yet. I want to get better at doing that. I've just been having, I mean, it's been like an, it's been an upward hill getting on the train of short form content and it's hard, but I think that's where we're heading and we're seeing more and more of that, but definitely long form content is still living on. Um, I love watching videos that are 30 plus minutes long. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes I'll actually prefer that to something that is too quick. Um, so I think it just depends on what you're looking for, but definitely I think any YouTuber would do themselves a favor in, you know, at least exploring with a short form content, to see what that might be like and where that can take them. Yeah. Um, so I mean, yeah, I think there's hard. always, it is hard, but what I've learned for myself is I think there's always going to be a place for like longer form content and people who are willing to like watch your whole YouTube video, whether it's 10 or 15 minutes, or even listen to like a 30 minute podcast or even longer podcast, those people are more invested in you, which I, I actually appreciate that like deeper connection. Like anyone yeah. who's still listening now, like I appreciate yeah. your connection and yeah, you're awesome. you being here because it, like that's the kind of connection I want to build. Cause I, I noticed like with short form content, TikToks, even though you watch things and you follow people, you don't, I can't name you anyone that I follow. It's, there's no loyalty. There's no, like, you don't go back to their page unless they're really, really good, but that's rare. Right. So I don't know. I still see like that YouTube is a special place and there's a place for people who are willing to invest longer time with you, even though it's, you know, people's brains are changing. Like we're right. literally like, <laughs> that's very strange it's, it's so weird but I agree I mean I think the YouTubers I follow or watch I'm just I feel more 
like you said, you kind of feel more loyal to those people. Whereas when I'm just mindlessly scrolling Instagram, sure, I will laugh or I'll cry or whatever, but it's very rarely that I will click on that person's page and be interested in what else they have to say. Whereas if I watch a conversation or listen to a podcast and I listen throughout, I'm more likely to be like, oh, this is very cool. I want more of that. Whereas I typically don't want more of TikToks. I'm like, this was yeah. fun. Yeah. <laughs> I want to see the next one and the next one. And yeah. not really, I don't really get into their page and see who they are or what they're doing. So I think there's definitely something, I think you, what you said was, yeah. I mean, I totally agree with that. Mm-hmm. And it's kind of like a badge of honor whenever I'm listening to a podcast and they're like, if you made it this far, I'm like, <laughs> I made it this far. Yeah. <laughs> We're still here. <laughs> Good job. Yeah. So final question, what is next for you? Do you have any goals for the future? Um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, definitely keep making videos until I'm old and gray. I will see about that, but for a, for a long time. And I've been working on, I haven't announced this, but I'll announce it. Well, I'll half announce it. Working on some products that maybe may be coming out pretty soon. And Any some other cla- clues on what they um, are? Well, it's something you can wear. Okay. Okay. So <laughs> I'm like, nice. let's see about that. It's something you can wear. <laughs> nice. um, that's one thing. I have a few other things that may be coming out in fall, which is not something you can wear, but it's still very useful. Um, I have the podcast. We're on summer break, but I'm going to continue after summer. And yeah, I mean, I think when you're, when you're in this industry, there are a lot of opportunities, which is, I mean, we're so grateful for that, but it's very easy just saying yes to too many things. Mm -hmm. Uh, cause everything sounds exciting and interesting and you kind of want to do it all. So I think I'm at a place where I'm kind of picking and choosing on where I feel like I'm, I'm just where I feel the most excited and where something can bring the most value as well. Um, so yeah, but something you can wear coming out soon. Lastly, where can we find you online? Oh, uh, well, Lana Blakely everywhere. So it's YouTube, uh, Instagram, Twitter. Uh, where are we? We're on TikTok, Facebook, just everywhere. All over the place. Lana Blakely. Everyone, if you're not already watching her videos and following Lana, definitely check her out. I'll leave all the links in the show notes below. Thank you so much for coming on. I had so much Thank fun. Thank you so much. Thank you. It was great speaking to you as well. Thank you. Thank you.